Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Xander's Facts. Hello, everybody. Welcome into Xander's Facts. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander, and I know, stop crying, y'all. But it's not a new episode of the Zader's Facts podcast. This is a Zader's Facts flashback. I know for the second week in a row, y'all, I'm sorry, but February has been a very busy month for Zander. I'm a busy boy. I don't know if y'all knew. So we're doing another flashback this week. But of course, that means y'all still get to listen to a bunch of facts. Facts you may not even have heard of before, which is why I do it, because we release so many facts on this podcast that I think not everybody can consume them all, at least in a healthy manner. So I try and break it up for you. So this week we are doing a flashback. I'm going to tell you about that in just a second before we do. Just wanted to remind you all that if you like the Zaders Facts podcast, if you think you're going to like this flashback, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review the podcast, check us out on all the socials, threads, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at Zaders Facts, that's Zader with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends. We like to call it Spread the Facts around here. Tell all your friends about the podcast. Tell all your friends about the newsletter too, Xander's Weekend Facts, which is a recap of the week's top headlines every Sunday morning. There is a new edition of that that is coming out this Sunday morning. It is free to sign up. Check the link in this episode's description. Go do that. And also check out the Xander's Facts link tree, which is also linked to this episode's description because it has all the Xander's Facts links that you need, including for everywhere to find the podcast, any of our past 133 episodes. I'm just replaying one or only part of one of our one of our 133 episodes so if you've missed any of our past episodes and you see a topic and you're like that looks interesting go listen to that so this week we are doing a flashback i know y'all i'm sorry but because it is the second week in a row of of a flashback i will tell you the podcast that i had planned this week or the topic that we're now going to do next week on our first episode of march 2024 Next week, we are going to be talking about grocery stores. And I know everybody just jumped out of their seat in excitement. Grocery stores, Xander, you're crazy. That's insane. I know, I know, I know. But grocery stores are part of the basic fabric of life, right? But you may have noticed there's only like a few national brands in the U.S. Why is that? I'm going to go into that this week on the podcast. And if you haven't heard, two of the largest grocery store chains in America Kroger and Albertsons are planning to merge, and I'm going to tell y'all about all the implications you need to know about that, because there are plenty. We're going to be talking about that next week on the Zader's Facts podcast, episode 134. You were going to want to listen to that, but this week is a Zader's Facts flashback. We are going back to January, just last month, episode 129. When before the Iowa caucuses, I previewed the presidential primary elections for this year, because as the title of that episode was, welcome to a presidential election year, y'all. It is a presidential election year, and we are just getting started on our elections, even though it feels like the primaries are basically over, because I would guarantee you, unless something tragic happens, that the parties have pretty much selected their nominees But because we are in the thick of the elections right now, last week was South Carolina for the Republicans. Just this Tuesday was Michigan. Next week is Super Tuesday, the biggest day on the calendar for the presidential primaries when a ton of states vote. So since we're in the thick of it, I thought I'd go back to just last month and see what we were talking about on our preview of the presidential primary elections. So let's get to that. Episode 129 from last month when we talked about previewing the presidential primary elections. Let's get to that right here as the Zaders Facts Podcast continues. Zaders Facts. We are talking politics. As I said, our bread and butter this week on the podcast because it is 2024. If you didn't know, the United States usually elects a president every four years. And the last one was in 2020. And so this one, the next one, is in 2024. This one, because we're talking about it already. It's already happening, y'all. And we got a lot to cover, so I don't want to give this big introduction. But let me just say, it's a presidential election year. I know the general election isn't until November, 
but we're still going to be talking about the race all year long. That's because the race to determine who is going to be the nominee of each major political party begins this month. Next week, in fact, and if you you don't even have to be a political nerd to know this, but you would know that what always comes first, the Iowa caucuses. Well, what has in the past, maybe not in the future, not even this year for one political party. I'm going to explain all of that to y'all. This is our first and what I think is going to be many podcasts where we talk about the presidential election this year in 2024, because we've got the Iowa caucuses, which are basically the kickoff of the election season when they happen in the first month or two of the presidential election year. So y'all might have some questions. What are the Iowa caucuses? What is a caucus? I thought we did primaries. How do I vote? Who are the candidates? I have no clue. I got all the answers that y'all need to know on January 11th of 2024. What are caucuses? How do they differentiate from primaries? How do we nominate or how do the two parties nominate a presidential candidate, how they do that every four years. Who are the candidates who are in this year's field in on both parties? And also a big question that I think probably gets asked a lot every four years, do the Iowa caucuses predict who will become the presidential nominee? That might be good to know as we take a look at the results that are going to come in next week for the Iowa caucuses. And I'm also going to give you all the schedule for this primary season, what all is going to go down this year, at least Politically, there's a lot of things that are going to happen with these candidates, a certain candidate. There's a lot of things that's going to be happening with him this year. But we're really going to focus on the election politics this week, primaries, caucuses, the Iowa caucuses. I'm going to give you, of course, all the facts that you need to know. So let's get to it. We are kicking off election season by talking about the Iowa caucuses and what you need to know. So let's get to it. And first off, we got the Iowa caucuses. What are they? What is a caucus? What is a primary? There's two ways that presidential elections are conducted in the U.S. in the run-up to nominating a candidate for a major party. You might realize when you go to vote for president that there's only a couple of names on there, and there's only one Democrat and there's only one Republican. So how do these major political parties, and we only have two of them in the U.S., for better or worse, how do those parties go about nominating a candidate to represent them in the presidential election? So obviously, all 50 states and territories vote on who they want to see represented out of all the candidates, the Democrats, the Republicans, who declare their candidacy. For president of the United States. And there's two ways that a state, overall ways, that a state can hold that vote. And that's where we get into primaries and caucuses. Primaries, usually straightforward. They're basically elections where you choose your preferred candidate by casting a ballot. Some states, they have the ranked choice voting. You click multiple people, but you have a ballot. You choose the person you want, or you choose the multiple people ranked, however your state does it, and you cast that ballot usually easy, like a normal election would go. Then we have caucuses. Caucuses are a little different. They're basically meetings that are organized not by the state, the State Department of Elections, but by the political parties themselves. These meetings, they can be held at the county level, the district level, or the precinct level. They can be super small, and these can be held really in two ways. Either people choose their candidate on a secret ballot kind of like a primary, but you still have this meeting that you have to go to to actually get the ballot or get the piece of paper that you can write the candidate down the who you want. There's that method, but there's also the group method. They can form groups according to their chosen candidate. In the group method, each group is trying to convince people to join their group, which I know is kind of strange, but I'll mention it more in a second. But there's also three different ways that primaries and caucuses can be held. We've got open primaries and caucuses, closed primaries and caucuses, and then some sort of variation in the middle. So the first is an open primary or caucus. What does that mean? That means that to take part in a certain political party's primary or caucus, you do not have to be a member of that political party. On the other hand, you've got a closed primary or a caucus. That means that you do have to be a member of that political party to participate in their primary or that caucus. 
And then there's like the semi-open and the semi-closed primaries and caucuses, which are basically variations of the two main types. So I have compiled the list of all the states that are open, that are closed, that are some variation in the middle. So I got them for you because everybody, all 50 states are going to be voting. They've either got a primary or election this year. So listen up, y'all, because your state might be in one of these. Get ready. So there's only 11 states that use the closed primary system, the one where you have to be a member of that political party to participate in that primary or that caucus. Those 11 states are Arizona, Delaware, Florida, Kentucky, Louisiana, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, and Wyoming. 14 other states use a partially closed system. That means that these states do allow political parties to close their primaries or their caucuses so that only registered members of the party can participate. But it also means that parties are also allowed to hold open primaries or caucuses. And parties also have the option of including unaffiliated voters, which can also mean excluding members of other parties, which is partially closed. That's what that means. So parties can also in these states change whether they want to hold an open or a closed primary from year to year. And so the 14 states and D.C., D.C. is in this too, that hold these partially closed primaries or caucuses are Alaska, California, Connecticut, Hawaii, Idaho, Kansas, Maryland, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, South Dakota, Utah, Washington, and West Virginia. But then on the other side, you've got the partially open system which allows voters to cross party lines, but you have to publicly declare your ballot choice when you vote in a primary or a caucus. And if not, that ballot choice could be regarded as registering with that party. There's only five states that allow that. There's Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Nebraska, and Ohio. And there's also seven states that are open to unaffiliated voters, meaning while voters who are registered with a political party cannot vote in any other party's primary. So if you're a Republican, you can't vote in the Democratic primary. But unaffiliated voters who aren't registered with a political party can vote in any primary that they choose. And voting in a party's primary or caucus as an unaffiliated voter does not change that unaffiliated status to what that party was. These eight states are Colorado, Kansas, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. And then you've got 16 states that are basically open primaries and caucuses. You can do whatever you want. You can choose whoever you want, I guess, or out of the, usually out of the two main political parties. 16 states, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, North Dakota, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Anyone, regardless of party affiliation, can vote in any primary that they choose. Most of these states don't even ask you to choose a party status on their voter registration form. Like, you can't register with a party here in Virginia because there's no way you can. They don't ask you that. And so that's not always the same for every type of election. Those are the processes for presidential elections, but it can be different depending on whether it's a congressional election or a state election or a local election or whatever. You should probably look up the laws for your state for those because that would take a whole lot of time on this podcast, but those are the laws for presidential elections. But also you've got states that hold caucuses and other states that hold primaries. So which states hold caucuses instead of primaries? Well, this year, There are seven states that are holding caucuses instead of primaries on the Republican side. You've got Iowa, of course, they're the first one, but also Nevada, Idaho, Missouri, North Dakota, Utah, and Hawaii. And that's an order of when they come on the list. So that means Nevada is going to be held soon. Hawaii is basically near the end. And the rest of the states use primaries. But just a little refresher on the entire nomination process for the major political parties, because some states use caucuses, some states use primaries, but how do the parties as a whole select their presidential nominee? Good question. So once we turn the calendar to an election year, as we have, we begin the presidential primary process. All 50 states, the District of Columbia, and many of the U.S. territories either hold a primary or a caucus, usually in the winter or the spring months, to determine who wins that state for each party. The Democrats hold their own primaries 
and so do the Republicans. When a candidate wins the most votes in a state, though, you would think they would win the state. They get all of what they call the delegates. Delegates are pledged to nominate a candidate at the party's convention, which is held in the summer. But when you win the most votes, not always do you gain all the delegates. You may gain some, but always, and you may not even gain the most. It's a little confusing, so I'm going to try and simplify it here, because each party also has a different set of rules as to how delegates are awarded. So, for the Democrats... There are an estimated 4,532 delegates up for grabs all over the United States of America. That includes 3,788 pledge delegates and 744 automatic delegates, which you also might know as superdelegates. They are not called superdelegates anymore. When a candidate wins the most votes in a state primary or a caucus, they win a bunch. But sometimes, mostly, usually, in the Democratic Party, not all of that state's pledged delegates. In fact, candidates who get second, third, or fourth, they can all win delegates too. And that's because candidates can win at-large delegates and PLEO delegates, which are party leaders and elected officials. That's what PLEO stands for. Based on the percentage of votes they get, that's true for the overall statewide vote total and also for the vote total in each congressional district of the state. So you could get 5% of the state total, but you could get 40% in one district, and you could win that district. And so you would gain delegates from that congressional district. And that's why in 2020, in the Iowa caucuses, Joe Biden, who, as you all know, is the current president of the United States, finished fourth in Iowa, but he got the most pledged delegates. So candidates need to get 15% of the total vote to get awarded delegates. That's true for the statewide vote and also for the district vote. If you don't get 15% of the statewide vote, you can still get 15% of a district vote and get delegates, perhaps. So you've got that side of it. And then you've got the automatic delegates. Those are delegates that are not pledged to vote for any particular candidate. The pledged delegates basically have to vote for the candidate that they have been chosen for. But the super delegates or the automatic delegates, they aren't. But recently there's been some rules changes with the convention process. That's that happens later in the summer. The Democrats have one, the Republicans have one, and that is where they al- nominate their presidential candidate. And so they have the first round of voting. And in the first round of voting, only the pledge delegates can vote in the nomination process. It used to be that the automatic delegates were also able to vote, which could, you know, change up the race possibly. But after 2016, Bernie Sanders was not very happy with the superdelegates who a lot of them went to Hillary Clinton. He was not happy with that. So they changed the rules. Superdelegates, automatic delegates, are not able to vote in the first round of the nomination process of the convention. But if it gets to a second round, they are. And at some point, the pledged delegates don't even have to vote for who they have been pledged to. It's a very complicated process. That happens if there's a contested convention, if no candidate wins 50 plus 1 percent, I think it is, of the total number of delegates at the convention. So that's it's a very complicated process for the Democrats, and it doesn't get much easier for the Republicans because the GOP has an estimated 2,469 delegates that are up for grabs in 2024. 2,365 of these are bound delegates, what pledge delegates, but the GOP calls them bound delegates and unbound. There's 104 unbound delegates, which are basically unpledged. States have different methods to awarding delegates. Some states award delegates in proportion to the share of the vote that they receive, and this can be done solely from the statewide vote, or it can be done from the vote in districts as well, as I mentioned earlier. This is the method that all states holding their primaries or caucuses before March 15th have to use. So Iowa has to use this, New Hampshire, which comes next, they have to use it, and a bunch of other states do too. And there's also the winner-take-all method where all the delegates 
of that state are awarded to the winner. And then there's also hybrid methods where delegates are awarded with a mix of the winner take all methods and proportional elections. So it can get confusing depending on which state you live in. And these delegates, except for the Democrats, automatic delegates, are awarded as states vote. And then you get the conventions that take place later this summer after all the states and territories have voted. At these conventions, the parties don't just nominate a candidate. They also adopt their platforms and their rules, but they also do nominate a candidate to serve as their party's nominee for president. So that's really how the overall process of nominating a candidate works. It gets a lot more in the weeds, but that's kind of like a simplified overview. What do you say? But back to Iowa. Iowa's really important because they're the first state to hold a contest this year in the Republican process. And they have been the first on the calendar dating back to 1972. And when the caucuses begin on Monday night at 7 p.m. local time, that's 8 p.m. Eastern, there are going to be roughly 1,670 different precincts all across the state where members of the Republican Party write down the candidate of their choosing on a slip of paper. You may have seen, like in the past, Democrats held the method, the group method, where they were in gymnasiums and libraries and schools and stuff, and they were just like gathering around. Hey, I vote for Bernie, come over here. No, I vote for Biden, come over here. They did that, and there's a reason they don't do that anymore. I'm going to bring that up in a second. But the Republicans, they're not doing that this year. They usually have not done that. They do the secret ballot. They give you a slip of paper and you write down your preferred candidate. That's probably a lot easier that way if you're going to go the caucus route, which there's a lot of critiques of caucuses. It's not you can't really mail in a ballot. You have to go to a meeting place on a certain time, day. That can be really inconvenient. Um, This Monday, it's happening, which is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's a federal holiday, but it's happening in Iowa. I don't know if you've seen the weather report in Iowa. It is going to be freezing cold. Wind chills are going to be in the negatives, I have heard. So it's inconvenient, but also it is part of our history as Americans. It is, for a political nerd, political junkies, it's fun to watch. But I will admit, it might not be the most efficient way to nominate a presidential candidate. Anyways, only registered Republicans are allowed to participate in the Republican caucus, but people can change their registration or register to vote for the first time at the site of their precinct for their caucus. And also, if you are 17, but you're going to be turning 18 before November 5th, the general election, you can also vote in the caucus. And caucuses are held all over. As I said, they can be in community rooms, schools, libraries, churches, even people's living rooms. All over the state, it's kind of crazy. And over the next few hours, after 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. local time, Monday night, we'll slowly get the results and we'll learn how many delegates each candidate is awarded. That's for the Republicans. The Democrats totally revamped their calendar this year, meaning Iowa is no longer first on the list of state elections. So while Democrats are still actually going to hold in-person caucuses on Monday, to hold party business is what they call it, basically, also known as kind of boring stuff for most people. To be honest, they're not going to be picking a presidential nominee. Instead, Democrats move to an entirely mail-in system where Democrats can request an absentee presidential preference card, and they then have to return that to the state party before March 5th, which is when the results are going to be announced for the Democratic election in Iowa. We're all caught up on how the nomination process works. Thanks goodness that's over. So let's get to 2024. And the candidates who are in play, who are in the running, have announced their candidacy for President of the United States. Who are those people? Because we got the Iowa caucuses taking place next week. Here's who has survived so far. And of course, Democratic nomination process right now is a little bleh, boring. So we'll be focusing mostly on the contested Republican field. As of Wednesday night, another, well, listen, okay, y'all, I'm not going to pretend I didn't know all this information was going to ha- come out on Wednesday, the Alabama stuff, and this political news that dropped on Wednesday. A candidate 
you might know, dropped out of the Republican presidential race on Wednesday. We'll talk about him in just a second. But as of Wednesday night, we have five candidates running, and you probably know them all. But I'm going to list them out here along with what NBC News has compiled as some of their campaign positions, which I thought was pretty, you know, good to know if you're going to actually consider to vote for them. So of the five, we've got number one, the biggest one, Mr. Donnie Boy, Donald Trump, who is the former president of the United States. He served from 2017 to 2021, in case you don't remember. He was the first candidate to enter his name into the GOP race right after the midterm elections in 2022. But he's also the first former president ever to face criminal charges. He's been indicted four times now. First was by a Manhattan grand jury in a case related to paying off porn star Stormy Daniels. By special counsel Jack Smith, twice federal charges, the first for his handling of classified documents, which is in the Southern District of Florida, and then for his attempts to overturn the 2020 presidential election, which, if you don't know, he lost to Joe Biden in D.C., and also by a special grand jury in Georgia for his attempts to overturn the results of that election, the 2021, in the state of Georgia. We have talked about all those cases on previous podcasts, by the way, if you want to go listen to those. But what NBC has compiled as Trump's some of his major campaign positions, he would support legislation that represents a, quote, record investment, unquote, in police. He would pardon, quote, a large portion, unquote, of the people convicted of federal offenses for their participation in the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Remember, remember that is the insurrection sign an executive order instructing federal agencies to, quote, cease all programs that promote the concept of sex and gender transition at any age, unquote, punish doctors who provide gender affirming care to minors, part of that, quote, get something done, unquote, on abortion. That is all it says. Um, It says he's declined to specify how many weeks into a pregnancy he would support a ban, but he has said a federal ban would need to include exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother, which is not a common policy, at least in the Republican Party. You've also got Nikki Haley, who was the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She served from 2017 to 2018 under Trump. She also served as governor of South Carolina from 2011 to 2017. Haley has called for a, quote, new generation of leadership, unquote. And she's the only woman who was a major candidate in the Republican race. Her campaign positions, as compiled by NBC News, she wants to find, quote, a national consensus, unquote, on abortion. She's declined to specify how many weeks into a pregnancy she would support a ban. As governor of South Carolina, she actually signed a law that would ban abortions at 20 weeks with no exceptions for rape or incest. That law, I think, has since been superseded by another law that has passed. She would restart the Trump era, quote, remain in Mexico, unquote, policy for asylum seekers. She would mandate a national E-Verify program for businesses to prevent the hiring of immigrants in the country illegally, which she started in South Carolina. She would, quote, end sanctuary cities, unquote. She would hire more Border Patrol and ICE agents. She supports term limits for members of Congress. And she also supports, quote, a mandatory mental competency test for politicians over 75 years old, unquote. You've also got Ron DeSantis, who was the current governor of Florida and has also previously served in Congress from 2017 to 2018. And he gained a nationwide following as Florida's governor due to his positions on COVID, immigration, and LGBTQ rights, most notably. He's called Florida, quote, where woke goes to die, unquote, and said he wants to make America Florida. His campaign positions, according to NBC, are encouraging Congress to take up nationwide school choice legislation. We've talked about school choice on this podcast before. Supports the six-week abortion ban he signed into law in Florida. That law includes exceptions for rape and incest up to 15 weeks. He has not taken a position on whether the U.S. should send more military assistance or weapons to Ukraine. He would declare a national emergency to mobilize more resources to the southern border and, quote, construct the border wall, unquote. You've also got Vivek Ramaswamy, who is the former CEO of Roviant Sciences, which is a biotech pharmaceutical company that he founded. He's also the youngest Republican candidate at 38 years old. He's got a net worth of around $600 million, and he has declared himself 
a quote unquote anti woke capitalist who has built himself as a quote true outsider unquote. He also wrote the book Woke Inc. If you haven't read that, and he's been an advocate of former President Trump and has vowed to take his agenda, what he says quote unquote, even further. His campaign positions compiled by NBC News. He wants to increase the voting age to 25 years old. If you didn't know, it's at 18 right now. Voters under 25 under this plan, though, could vote by completing a national service requirement or passing a civics test. He would shut down the Department of Education, the FBI, and the IRS. He said regarding that, quote, rebuild from scratch when required, unquote. He would ban, quote, gender confusion care for minors, unquote. He would pardon, quote, defendants of politicized prosecutions, unquote, including Trump and, quote, peaceful January 6th protesters, unquote. And then the final candidate you have who has declared he's running, who is still running right now on the Republican side, is Asa Hutchinson. He is the former governor of Arkansas from 2015 to 2023. He also served in Congress back in the day. He was one of the House impeachment managers for President Bill Clinton's impeachment trial, which was back in 1998 and 1999. He's a critic of Trump. Hutchinson has claimed that Trump claiming the GOP nomination would be a, quote, worst scenario, unquote, for Republicans. When he asked if he would support Trump as the nominee, he said, quote, I don't expect that he'll be the nominee, and I do expect that I will be supporting the nominee, unquote, also known as word salad. Campaign positions, according to NBC, he would reduce the federal civilian workforce by 10%. He would expand computer science education into, quote, every grade school and high school, unquote, to help America better compete with China. He would convene a commission to assure the future of Social Security and Medicare. He would sign a federal abortion ban that includes exceptions. He has not specified how many weeks into a pregnancy he would support a ban. As governor, he did sign a law a near total ban with an exception only for the life of the mother while saying he still personally supported additional exceptions, but he signed a law that does not do that. There's been a couple other candidates too, besides those five. Just on Wednesday, as I mentioned, former New Jersey governor Chris Christie suspended his campaign. So sad. He was a supporter of Trump in 2016, all the way through the 2020 election. He was, he got COVID helping Trump prepare for the debates in 2020. But he campaigned in 2024 as a fierce critic of the former president. He said he will not support him. He continued to attack Trump on Wednesday with his um, farewell speech from the campaign, I guess. And then he was also, on Wednesday, caught on a hot mic moment just before he announced he was ending his campaign, criticizing both Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. Christie is out. So are other candidates, including North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, former Vice President Mike Pence, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, and Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. If you don't remember, all of them were running for president at some point last year. So those are all the candidates. But what do the polls say right now? And again, as we've learned over the last several years of doing this podcast, of looking at polling right before elections happen, polling isn't always the number one key navigator of what exactly is going to happen. But it is a good thing to look at just to see, you know, the overall standpoint. The polling isn't going to be so way off. We're usually talking about a couple of points, usually, you know. But right now, what the polls say nationwide is that Trump, as expected, has a massive lead. The 538 average of polls as of January 10th has Trump with 61% of the vote DeSantis is in second place. He's got 12.5%. Nikki Haley's third, 11.5%. That's followed by Ramaswamy at 4.5%. And Asa Hutchinson at 0.9%. And Chris Christie was at 3.6%. So you can kind of see why he dropped out. He kind of knew he wasn't getting anything. Just on Wednesday, CNN held a Republican presidential debate, which I watched and then am recording this podcast. Which, so I guess it was kind of good I recorded this on Wednesday and it's coming out on Thursday. But in that debate, only DeSantis and Haley qualified and attended. Trump also qualified. He did not attend, though. He did his own town hall on Fox News. I do not know how that went. I haven't seen any clips. 
don't want to really. Electrocution. But Trump's lead has expanded over the last few months. Ron DeSantis's average was over 30% or so just a year ago. He has dropped, though. Nikki Haley's had a late surge in the last few weeks. She's gotten up, at least in the average, close to DeSantis. But now specific to Iowa, because that's what we're going to be watching on Monday. Like, it's kind of like, for the primaries, taking a look at a nationwide poll for the presidential election, Trump versus Biden, whatever, the two top candidates versus each other. Take it with a grain of salt, because that's not how we elect presidents. We use the Electoral College. But it is a good indicator, you know, and taking a look at the nationwide vote for the primary, don't, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it could be a good indicator, especially when one candidate has 61% of the vote and second place has 12.5%. But when we take a look at Iowa, hopefully the poll is more accurate to the results we're going to see on Monday. And Trump continues to have a big lead in the Iowa poll. In the latest Des Moines Register, NBC News, Mediacom, Iowa poll, which is seen as basically the gold standard of Iowa caucuses polling. Trump has 51% of the vote. DeSantis has 19%. Haley has 16%. Ramaswamy, 5%. And Hutchinson at 1%. So you can kind of tell where that race is going. The 538 average shows similar numbers. Trump's at 52%. DeSantis and Haley are at 17. Ramaswamy at 6. Hutchinson again at 1. So probably, I might, I wasn't going to, inject my opinion into this podcast very much are you done but i'd probably say trump is gonna win iowa now again that does not mean he could get the most delegates he might not but when you're taking a look at the status of your campaign whether you finish first second third fourth in iowa it does matter optically it does matter what happens in iowa and new hampshire in the republican process because they are first and also because of campaign strategies. DeSantis has basically moved to Iowa. He is focusing solely on that state. If he can't beat Nikki Haley, at least, that is massive trouble for him. So again, Trump's likely to win. That does not mean he gains all the state's delegates. DeSantis and Haley are also likely to grab some. How much, though? That's all going to be determined on what we see Monday night. Hopefully not too late. But then also, we're still looking at polling from New Hampshire, which is the next state. And it's the first primary state for the Republicans. Trump is under 50% of the 538 average at 42%. And Nikki Haley's been gaining ground. She's at 30% after being at 15% back in November. So New Hampshire could be a little more interesting. But again, the way the delegates, popular vote, ultimately doesn't matter. What matters are the number of delegates you get in the presidential nomination process. And so Politico, which is one of the top politics news sources, really, they have an article that detailed what the winning paths could be for each of the five remaining Republican candidates, along with what could make them sink, which I found really interesting. So I wanted to read that off for you for all five candidates. You've got of course, the front runner, basically, Donald Trump, who Politico describes as his winning path as Trump remains popular among the Republican base despite the numerous scandals and the insurrection riot at the Capitol that punctuated his turbulent presidency. His false claim that he was the rightful winner of the 2020 election has given his comeback bid a patina of grievance to add to his appeal to return to the policies of his administration. With only a few exceptions, Trump's likely rivals have refrained from criticizing his time in office or behavior outside of it, even after four separate criminal indictments. Winning path is basically keep doing what you're doing because it's working in the Republican primary. The losing path, though, Politico describes as Trump fatigue. Trump has dominated American politics in both parties since he first became a candidate in 2015. Unlike his first campaign, when the field was split against him, Trump could face a single competitor who serves as a counterweight in DeSantis. Politico didn't put this in there, but you could probably interchange Haley in that too, if you know the recent surge in polling is any indication. But also what they say, and legal jeopardy on multiple fronts could convince enough Republican primary voters to turn the page and look to the future, even if they like Trump and his record as president. So Trump fatigue could be the thing that ultimately gets him, even among Republican primary voters. Are there enough voters who would do that? 
the um, I don't know. The other one, the other candidates, though, Nikki Haley, her winning path as the alternative to a months long Trump DeSantis food fight, a win in South Carolina's primary, which is fourth after Iowa, New Hampshire and Nevada, would go a long way to vaulting Haley into the top tier already. Haley is the most politically accomplished woman as a twice-elected governor and cabinet member to enter a Republican presidential primary field. Despite the gender gap between the parties, women make up nearly half of the GOP primary electorate. Nick Haley, of course, is from South Carolina, and which is important because it is the fourth state on the primary calendar. And then her losing path, like all of the candidates below the top tier, which are basically Trump, that's the top tier, Haley risks getting drowned out in a primary where Trump and DeSantis suck up most of the oxygen, and Haley's seemingly shifting views of Trump after the January 6th riot threaten her credibility in taking on her former boss. For Ron DeSantis, his winning path, DeSantis doesn't want to be the anti-Trump, but rather a more effective and less scandalous continuation of the former president's political movement. By the numbers, it could be a winning primary coalition to combine Trump fans with loyal Republicans who are skeptical about a third straight Trump nomination. But it requires DeSantis to go directly at Trump without alienating too many of his supporters and position himself as a more electable alternative. His losing path, his post-lodge struggles have exposed some of his liabilities. There's the perception that he's an awkward campaigner. Yeah, and his efforts to sell Trump light to voters who want the full calorie version have fizzled so far. Trump has attacked him from the left on abortion and entitlements, a strategy meant to undermine DeSantis's electability requirements. Then you've got, I mean, that's kind of like the second tier, right? Then you've got the other two. Vivek Ramaswamy, his winning path has described A relentless earned media campaign has vaulted Ramaswamy up the standings. Actually, winning the nomination is another story, but thus far, Ramaswamy has done what it takes to get a 38-year-old first-time candidate into contention. His losing path, all attention has been good attention for Ramaswamy thus far, but he is campaigning as a Trump heir apparent, not a rival. And as you can see, he did not qualify for the last Republican debate they just had, so... um. I'd say the attention he's been getting now has not been as good. And then you've got Asa Hutchinson. His winning path, Hutchinson has expressed misgivings about the GOP's direction during the Trump era, but selling a return to the conservatism of the 1990s and the 2000s is an uphill battle. He says Trump should drop out of the race following his multiple criminal indictments, far from a majority opinion in the party. So even his winning path doesn't sound too good. His losing path... He could end up like two of Trump's 2016 rivals, former New York Governor George Pataki, or another Arkansas governor, Mike Huckabee, who barely register after their political moments have already passed them by. Oh, that's kind of sad. But so those are the Republican candidates that are winning strategies and what they could do to lose, which for four of them might be kind of likely. It's the truth. The Democratic candidates, though, on the other hand, of course, the Democrats are there as well. Incumbent President Joe Biden is running. So, you know, barring anything catastrophic or an unexpected withdrawal from the race, he will win the Democratic nomination. But he does have two other notable names in the Democratic primary who are running. One is current Congressman Dean Phillips from Minnesota. He launched his campaign on October 26th unexpectedly and said it was time for a new generation to lead the Democratic Party. He served as the president and the CEO of Phillips Distilling Company, his family's liquor business, and is the former co-owner of Talenti Gelato, which I will say is very yummy. But Phillips has already missed the filing deadline for Nevada's primary and is polling poorly, which does not make him a very viable alternative to Biden. And another is Marianne Williamson, who also ran in 2020. Williamson is an author and a speaker who, if you don't remember, made her name on the Oprah Winifrey show when she served as Oprah's spiritual advisor. She is also not really putting a dent into Biden. That's basically the Democratic field. But you've also got three different notable names for third party candidates, which won't really be in the running right now. But if they last, might be good to know for later. You've got Robert F. Kennedy Jr., 
the son of Robert F. Kennedy and the nephew of former President John F. Kennedy. He was running in the Democratic primary, but he announced he was running as an independent back in October. He is an environmental lawyer and an activist who has peddled misinformation on COVID and vaccines, if you didn't know. Cornell West is a professor, historian, and activist who is running also as an independent. And Jill Stein, who was the Green Party's nominee in 2012 and 2016, is back running for that party's nomination once again, because third time is definitely the charm for the for the Green Party. So those are the candidates running for president. And then in the context of Iowa, Monday night, those five that I mentioned above are the ones who are going to be out there. I mean, you won't see them on the ballot because you have to actually write somebody down. Those are the five you can write down, I guess. You could write down somebody else, but that would kind of be silly. So as we focus on Iowa over the next few days, it's important to take a look at history, as we often do on this podcast. So I ask the question, do the Iowa caucuses predict who will become the presidential nominee? Now, before this year, the Iowa caucuses were always the first event on the presidential primary calendar for both parties in every election since 1972. But did they always correctly predict the presidential nominee? Let's just go back to 2020 to find out, because Republicans, that was, you know, uncontested, basically, for Trump. He got over 90% of the vote. But what about the Democrats? Well, as I kind of alluded to earlier, the 2020 Iowa caucuses were such a disaster that the Democrats totally scrapped them this year because of controversies surrounding the counting of the votes. We don't really know who got the most votes, who the, what the final results were until like weeks later, I think. It was a bit of a mess. And that was even before COVID shut down everything, you know? So who ended up with the most votes in the 2020 Iowa caucuses? Because it wasn't Joe Biden. I'll just tell you that. It was Pete Buttigieg who, as you might know, is the current Secretary of Transportation, who got 26.2% of the vote, barely beating out Bernie Sanders, who had 26.1% of the vote. But Sanders actually got 12 pledged delegates. Buttigieg got nine. And who came next with 18.1% of the vote? Five pledged delegates. That would be Elizabeth Warren, who finished third. And then you get to fourth. Who was that? That would be the current president of the United States, Joe Biden, who got 15.8% of the vote, but he got 14 pledged delegates. So in terms of popular vote, no, the Iowa caucuses don't always predict who will become the party nominee, but Biden also got the most pledged delegates. Now, if he had not, if he had gotten fourth in pledged delegates too, that might have been the end, but we're here now. And so, as I said, the optics of getting second, third, fourth, first, they do matter. Also in terms of both popular vote and pledge delegates, but you can see what happens. That was 2020, and now you see who's president. But even further evidence points to 2016 to answer that question earlier. In the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton did beat Bernie Sanders by 0.3% of the vote. It was super close, unexpectedly. But in the Republican race, it was not Trump who finished first. It was Texas Senator Ted Rafael Cruz who came away with 27.6% of the vote in eight delegates. Trump was second. He got seven delegates and 24.3% of the vote. So, yeah, not everyone who wins the most delegates in Iowa wins the nomination. In 2012, Rick Santorum won Iowa. Mitt Romney was the eventual nominee. In 2008, Mike Huckabee won 34% of the vote. And the eventual nominee, John McCain, got 13%. He finished fourth, but he won the Republican nomination. Now, Barack Obama, on the other side, he did win Iowa. He got 38% of the vote, and that was really a jolt to his 2008 campaign. And George W. Bush was also able to win in a contested field in 2000. But if we're not counting unopposed elections or years when one candidate got over 90% of the vote, since 1972, The Iowa caucuses have only predicted the presidential nominee 10 times out of 19 elections. Now you could say, oh my gosh, that's over 50%, but not by much also. And out of all the Republican elections that fit that criteria since 1972 that have been held, only three correctly predicted the nominee. That's a fact. So, you know, politically, 
It's a right-leaning state. The demographics are not like really the rest of America. I was not going to be that sought after in the general election. And if its election was held later in the primary calendar, it likely wouldn't command much attention. But because it comes first, it comes with that aura, basically. And that can be a good springboard for some campaigns. That's what Ron DeSantis is banking on, basically. He basically moved his campaign headquarters to the state. He got the endorsement of the Republican governor of the state, Kim Reynolds. But also, as I said, if he doesn't do too well, that could be the death of his campaign. Even if it's just, you know, one not that big, not that very representative of America state in Iowa. But again, because it comes first, it's super important. At least this year for the Republicans, because the Democrats changed all that. So. Another question, what is the schedule for this primary season? Because we got the Iowa caucuses who basically kick off the primary season. But beyond that, here's what's to come in the race for the White House in 2024. Later this month, in January, New Hampshire takes the spotlight for their first in the nation primary. Republicans will have 22 delegates up for grabs. Democrats will have 10. But those 10 will be non-binding because I got another story for y'all. That's because the Democratic National Committee and New Hampshire have not been best friends recently. Last year, the DNC approved a new primary calendar that did not have Iowa as the first state on the calendar, did not have New Hampshire as the first primary. It had South Carolina as the first state on the calendar. They would hold their primary on February 3rd, followed by Nevada and New Hampshire on February 6th, but apparently, this is what has been claimed, New Hampshire state law requires it to have the first primary in the country, which I don't know how in the world that is legally enforceable, but okay. But in New Hampshire, here's the thing, the Secretary of State, who is currently Republican, has the sole authority to set presidential primary dates. And the Secretary of State announced that the date for both Democrats and Republicans would be on January 23rd. So on January 6th, just a couple days ago, 2024, not 2021, the DNC said that the primary would be unsanctioned. That means that the delegates will be non-binding. But even many New Hampshire Democrats are unhappy with the National Party. So it's a whole kerfuffle there. So the primary is not happening on February 6th. It's happening on January 23rd. So technically, the Democratic primary is happening then, but it won't be sanctioned by the DNC. And while there will be a total of 21 names on the ballot, it's a bit much because I believe all you have to do to get on the ballot in New Hampshire is pay a $1,000 filing fee, which seriously, New Hampshire, if you want to be taken seriously, come on. But there's going to be 21 names on that ballot. Joe Biden's name will not be one of them because he said if it's not a DNC sanctioned, primary i'm not taking part in it but he's probably still gonna win though because his supporters are also running a write-in campaign and i think i think he'll be okay republicans are also going to be holding their new hampshire primary as i said on january 23rd not no controversy for the republicans on that side and then you head into february and democrats officially begin their presidential nominating process by holding the south carolina primary on the third where 55 delegates will be up for grabs. And then three days later, Nevada will hold its presidential primary for the Democrats. But two days later, on February 8th, Nevada's Republican caucus is going to take place. So later in the month, the Republican primary in South Carolina is going to be held on February 24th, with Michigan holding its primary for both parties on the 27th. And then we get to March, which is usually... The biggest month in terms of the number of states that hold their primary elections and the number of delegates that you can win. March is the big one. On the 2nd of March, you've got Idaho, Michigan, and Missouri who are all holding their Republican caucuses. D.C. is holding their GOP primary the next day. And then on the 4th, North Dakota's Republican caucus is taking place. And then you've got March 5th. Mark this down, y'all. Super Tuesday. 16 states are going to be voting all across the country. Alabama, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, 
Texas, Utah, Vermont, and Virginia are all holding either a primary or a caucus for both parties. And so is American Samoa, by the way. We got to include the territories. Alaska is holding their GOP primary, and March 5th is also the date where mail-in ballots must be submitted for Iowa's Democratic primary. First time they're doing that. The next week, on the 12th, Georgia, Mississippi, and Washington are holding their primaries for both parties. Hawaii is holding the Republican caucus. And Democrats abroad and the Northern Mariana Islands are holding their Democratic primaries. Democrats abroad are basically people who live abroad but are citizens of the U.S. They have to mail their ballots in by that date. The Northern Mariana Islands, their GOP caucus is on the 15th of March. Guam's GOP caucus is the next day. Then on the 19th of March, Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, and Ohio are all holding their primaries for both parties. Louisiana's primaries are on the 23rd, while the Democratic primary in Missouri is also set for that date. And then you turn the calendar over to April. Connecticut, Delaware, New York, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin are all holding their primaries for both parties on the same day as Alaska, Hawaii, and North Dakota's Democratic primaries. That is April 6th. Then on the 13th, Democrats in Wyoming are holding their primary, if there are any remaining Democrats in Wyoming, with the Puerto Rico GOP primary on April 21st. Democrats have their primary planned in Puerto Rico. On April 28th, but Pennsylvania's primaries for both parties come first on April 23rd. Then you get to May. Indiana's primaries will be on May 7th, followed by Maryland, Nebraska, and West Virginia on May 14th. Kentucky and Oregon follow on May 21st, followed by Idaho's Democratic primary on May 23rd. And then finally, in June, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, and South Dakota hold their primaries alongside DC for the Democrats. And then last, But certainly not least, of course, Guam and the Virgin Islands hold their Democratic caucus in Guam and primary in the Virgin Islands. And so there you have it, y'all. The complete list of all 50 states and U.S. territories in D.C. that are holding their primaries and caucuses for both major parties. And you know what? To be honest, both major parties could have their Nomination process is wrapped up by Super Tuesday. You just never know. But even if you live in Guam, in the Virgin Islands, your vote still counts, even if you come last, but certainly not least, as I said. Then in the process come the conventions. The Republicans are going to hold theirs first, July 15th to the 18th in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And the Democrats have the incumbent president, so they always come after They will hold theirs over a month later from August 19th to 22nd in Chicago. And then if they happen, you know, some people might not want to go to them. But we've got a couple of presidential debates scheduled. And y'all, first off, I hope you wrote every one of those dates down on your calendar because they're very important. But write these down because they might happen. The first presidential debate would take place on September 16th at Texas State University in San Marcos. That would be followed by the 2nd on October 1st at Virginia State University in Petersburg. And the final debate would be on October 9th at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And the vice presidential debate would take place on September 25th at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania. And then finally, the big day, Tuesday, November 5th, 2024 in the United States of America is one of my favorite days, Election Day, which I will say should be a federal holiday. It's not. It should be. There you have it, y'all. Get ready. It is election season. I hope you got all that. For election nerds like myself, Monday is going to be a big day. Whether or not it's going to be consequential in terms of the GOP primary, time will tell. But as I just shared, There are going to be important political events that are taking place all year long. So get ready. We are going to have lots of episodes this year where we are going to be bringing the facts to you regarding the presidential election in the U.S. all year long. I'm excited, y'all. We're going to have a lot of facts in 2024. 
But those are all the facts that I've got for this week, episode 129, regarding the whole process, how it works, what the Iowa caucuses are, when they're taking place this Monday. By the way, if you live in Iowa and you're a Republican, go do those. I doubt many Iowa Republicans are listening to this podcast, but if you are, just a little reminder. Also, what they mean, basically their significance, you know, being first is significant, but does that mean you usually predict who's going to be president? Mixed bag is basically what I would say. And then you've got all the dates down, the big dates for primaries, caucuses, conventions, and of course, Election Day, Tuesday, November 5th. It's going to be a big one, y'all. It's going to be a big year on the Xander's Facts podcast. Xander's Facts! So there you have it, y'all. That is this week's Xander's Facts flashback. Thank you all so much for listening to the facts from back in January. If you liked all the facts on this week's flashback, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review the podcast, check us out on all the social medias, threads, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, I'm on all those, at Xander's Facts, that's Xander with a Z, and most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, y'all, spread the facts, tell all your friends about the podcast so they can listen and download too, sign up for the Xander's Weekend Facts newsletter, click the special link in this episode's description, check out the Xander's Facts channel on YouTube to check out all our new episodes on YouTube when they eventually get uploaded, and make sure to check out the Xander's Facts link tree. It is linked in this episode's description. It has all the Xander's Facts links that you need for the podcast, the newsletter, the YouTube, xandersfacts.com, whatever you need is linked in this episode's description. So check that out. As I said earlier, Next week, we are talking about grocery stores. Super exciting, but there is exciting stuff to talk about with grocery stores, including combining mergers, monopolies. We'll talk about that next week on episode 134, I promise you, of the Xander's Facts podcast. But that is it, y'all. That is a wrap on this week's Xander's Facts flashback. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see y'all with episode 134 of the podcast next week. I love big leaf maples. I do too. Oh, this feels so good.